So hello, everybody. I'm Anita. I've been on the board a member for a couple of years. And a thank you so much to Julia Mahood for hanging in there with us. I know there's a time difference. <laughs> you're in Georgia, two hours uh, later than we are. And you're here to talk with us again about droning on about drones, fun facts about boy bees and their mysterious, mysterious congregational areas. Uh, I just wanted to say, Julia, you might want to, um, I don't know, I haven't seen you yet, but um, you've been, hi there. You've been with us a couple of times and I remember the first time I heard you, I was really, it really changed my whole perspective about drones because I had read this fun book called um, The Queen Must Die and Other Affairs of Bees and Men by William, um, along good and he basically called drones freeloaders and like they really should deserve to be just kicked out and they didn't earn their keep and so you really reframed that you know in terms of understanding the genetics and how how necessary and critical it is for us to understand drones and and the, the congregational areas that um sometimes are diminishing and we're not getting enough um queens made it so Julia comes to us from Georgia. She's a master beekeeper and she's been since 2004. She created the science, citizen science website called Map My DCA, which is Map My Drone Congregation Area. And you were awarded the Georgia Beekeeper of the Year in 2018. And you're also a graphic artist to design the Georgia Save the Honey Bee license plate, which uh, is really cool. And so we're really glad for you to be with us tonight to give us some more fun facts and, and research about um, drones in the area of beekeeping, honey beekeeping. And we thank you for your service to um, teaching people in the Georgia prison system about beekeeping as well as in your local and um, state organizations. So we're going to invite uh, Julia to talk with us for a bit and then if you have questions that come up while she's talking, feel free to put them in the chat box and I'll refer to those and we can look at those uh, when you're done and ready to take questions, Julia. So Great. thank you again for being here with us so late in your time zone and we're really grateful. Thank you. Well, I'm honored to be here. It's, um, I love your club. You all have such great energy. So I'm gonna share my screen. And away from start. All righty, does it look good on your end? Mm -hmm. Great. Yep. So thanks for that sweet introduction. Um, and thank you again, thanks for having me back uh, to speak to you guys again. I really enjoyed February 5th. And Bob wanted to, uh, me to talk a little more about drones and you all heard my um, game of drones talk in August. So what this talk is, I'm gonna kind of review some, the main facts about drones, so a little bit of a review. And then I'm gonna talk, I've been spending a lot of time this winter reading research papers and just coming thing, coming papers for information on drones. And so I found a lot of fun facts that I thought I'd share. And then I was also going to tell you about the research project that I did last summer with drones. So let's see. So to start, as you guys probably know, uh, th these are this uh, little drawing is of the three types of bees in the colony. And the queen is the tallest, but the drone is uh, weighs about 100 milligrams more. And of course, he's got these huge eyes and more of a blunt tipped abdomen as compared to the females in the colony. And this is a drone with his sisters. And you can tell again, look at his huge eyes and his blunt tipped abdomen compared to his sisters. And I do think that this is what the drones look like in the, in the uh, nest to the other bees because drones only live to be 22 to 32 days. And so they're always kind of young and fit. And y'all probably know that in the fall, the drones get kicked out and they don't get to overwinter. So they don't get to turn into old men. And one of the questions people ask sometimes is, what's with the plush, someone on, online called it a plush vest, which I thought was just a lovely way of putting 
this velvety, furry thorax that the drones have. They have a lot more hair on their thoraces compared to workers. And what I found is that, that um, or I, I didn't find research on it, but I had read that the reason why they probably have that fur is to warm up their flight muscles because flying is so integral to their purpose in life. And so they just have this extra plush vest to warm them up. But it's so pretty, I think, their velvety uh, vest. And we all know that it's really important for our colonies to be queen right. It's the most important thing, really. But also, it's important that they be drone right because they have a biological urge to raise drones. And um, as Anita was saying, frequently you'll hear all drones are a drain on resources and you shouldn't have them around. But we always need to keep in mind that the colonies will only raise drones if they can't, can't afford the resources. And if at any point in time they can't, they will um, cull the drones or refuse them entrance. And they will also um, do this thing called brood trimming, which is where they cannibalize eggs, larvae, and even capped pupae as changes in temperature and resources dictate. And this isn't just uh, of the drones. They'll also, also cannibalize eggs and larvae of workers. And what's fascinating to think about with this is all the feedback mechanisms that are going on in the colony at any given time so that how does one worker know what her sister is doing on another frame, which is just, it's just fascinating to think about how the communication is, all these things are going on that we can not possibly understand. But for the beekeeper, you just keep in mind that the, they're not going to have drones if they can't afford the, the resource drain. For drones, they, they are bigger bees and they need a bigger crib. So that's kind of where it starts. And what it looks like is if you let bees raise, build their own comb, what they will do is make smaller cells in the center and that's where they will raise the workers. And then these larger cells surrounding it, that's where they'll raise drones. And then of course they put pollen and honey in the corners. And the um, two primary objectives for survival of, of brood are, is temperature and food. So the workers in the middle are probably going to stay warmer and they're also probably going to get more food. It's sort of like being in a restaurant. You know, if you're in the middle, you'll get your coffee and water refilled more quickly than if you're out in the corner next to the restroom. And this is a uh, actual brood with uh, or a frame of actual brood. So you can see the difference between the drone brood. It looks like bubble wrap and the worker brood. And with the worker brood being surrounded by the drone brood, when it's cold, the worker brood is actually insulated by the drone brood, which is kind of cool because even in their infancy, they're serving the sort of more important workers. And I think that's kind of cool. An interesting fact about drone comb is that bees will make 14% of their comb sized to raise drone brood if left to their own devices out in the wild. Now they'll make the comb, 14% of the comb that size. That doesn't mean that they're gonna raise 14% of their brood as drones. Some of those big cells will end up being filled with honey. And what, what you'll see a lot is the drone, they'll, they'll raise a lot of drones in the spring. And then as the season, as the summer goes on, some of that will be converted to honey storage. From egg to emergence, the drone survival is about 50%. So it's much lower than the workers at 86%. And probably some of that, at least early in the season, does have to do with that temperature factor, that survival is uh, predicated on food and temperature. When a queen lays an egg, she puts her head in the cell and she feels with her front legs to see how big the cell is. And if the cell is small, if it's four and a half to five millimeters or so, what happens is she lays an egg and it goes down over this little thing called the valve fold. And at that point, she will uh, release a little sperm from her spermatheci and it will become fertilized, travel out through sting chamber and be deposited in a cell and become a worker. Now, if she felt that the cell was larger, it was about six millimeters or larger, her spermatheci doesn't release any sperm and the egg is unfertilized and it becomes a male. So drones are haploid. They, are, um, they come from just an egg, which is not fertilized and they have 16 chromosomes, whereas the females are diploid and they have 32 chromosomes. Now bees are different from humans. They don't have a sex chromosome like we do, like we have the X and the Y. What they have is a complementary sex determiner 
gene at a sex determination locus. So on this gene there, you, they will have alleles. And in the honeybee world, there are probably about 145 different sex alleles. Some of the older books you'll read say 16, 17, I think they've discovered about 87, but think that they're probably 145. So there are three options. There can be a, a fertilized egg has two with two different alleles. So say out of the 145, there's the mother uh, has the egg is a allele C and the sperm is an allele G. So they're different and they will become a female. And then of course we have the hemizygous where there's only one allele. If it's an unfertilized egg, you're gonna, they're gonna have the same allele as their mother. But there is a condition where the individual is homozygous. So it has two identical alleles and these are known as diploid drones. So it's a fertilized egg that both have say the C sex allele. And these diploid drones are, you never see them. They've only been raised in labs. And when they are raised to adulthood, they are infertile and they're small. And that's probably why the bees have evolved to figure out that that's what's happening. So what we see as beekeepers is this shotgun brood pattern. And this is different from looking at hygienic behavior where you just have a cell here and there open, but about half of it is open. And this is because when the diploid drone larvae uh, hatches out of the egg, from an egg to a larvae, the cuticular compound has a certain odor and the nurse bees can smell that. And so they gobble it up. They, nothing is wasted, it's protein. Uh, and I think it's kind of funny that we always talk about bees being gentle vegetarians, but the truth is they are sometimes cannibals. Because drones just have one set of chromosomes, you can sometimes see recessive genes expressed. I color in honeybees, the dominant gene trait, I color trait is um, black. And so you always see bees, workers and queens with black eyes, but occasionally you'll see drones with different color eyes. There are white eyed drones. I found this guy last summer. And they're also this sort of beige and uh, chartreuse green, tan and cherry red eyed drones, which is just kind of cool. The white eyed drones are blind, sadly, so they don't last long. You're probably all familiar with this type of chart where everyone's an egg for three days and then, um, then there are larvae for you know, typically workers is five days, queens is five days, and then the pupation times are what really differ. And drones take a lot more time to, prep, to pupate. However, these numbers are not set in stone. There are two factors, temperature and food, again, that make a big difference in the pupation times. And it can take um, up to 28 days for a drone to pupate if it's cold and they didn't get enough to eat, and as short as 20. And it can take only 16 days for a worker to, to um, pupate if they have lots of resources, which I think is kind of interesting just to keep in mind. This is what the drone's life looks like when he first emerges. The first day, his cuticle's hardening and he can't fly, so he's just really adorable. For the first week, drones are fed primarily by nurse bees. They feed them the regurgitated contents of their stomach. And as y'all know, nurse bees are constantly eating pollen and uh, honey, but they have that great protein in their stomachs that they regurgitate into the drones. And that protein helps them, helps their um, sperm mature. For the first 12 days, the reproductive organs are maturing. So they're, they have, they come into the world with everything they need, but their sperm has to move from the seminal, from the testes to the seminal vesicles. So that's happening. And day six to nine, they take their first flights. They take orientation and cleansing flights. And these are short flights. And then days 12 through 18 is when their mating flights can begin. 12 days at the earliest when they're sexually mature. Um, they're, they have, they continue to mature though until day 18. When does drone rearing happen? happen? The most drone rearing happens in the spring and it happens, the drones will be raised before the queens or before the bees are ready to make swarm cells. So it's kind of in time for drones to be sexually mature to make the queens because keep in mind, it takes them longer to pupate and then they have to walk around and be sexually mature. Drones are, however, are raised during a nectar flow at any point in the season in the spring and summer months. 
so any kind of nectar flow that's happening, you'll see the bees raise a little burst of drones. So now I'm gonna talk about the drones job. As you all probably know, the drones have one job primarily and that's to mate with other queens. So I'm gonna talk just for a minute about how they're equipped for their job and how they differ from workers. Compared to workers, drones have tiny mandibles. They don't need to have strong mandibles, mandibles to chew up propolis and do things like that. They just need to be able to uncap honey cells. And they have a short proboscis because they're not mining flowers for nectar. They're just drinking out of a honey cell. And what makes them super fun is they don't have a sting gland, so they can't sting you. And what they do have compared to workers is their antennae have 10 times the olfactory plates of workers. So they have this incredible sense of smell because they have to be able to smell queens flying in the air. And it's just amazing because we all know how incredible the workers can smell. So to, to be able to smell 10 times better is kind of a superpower. Their mandibles produce pheromones and these pheromones while they're flying around the DCAs help signal to other drones that they're in a DCA. And it also probably signals to the queens that they've made it into a DCA. Their compound eyes are much larger. They have a lot more facets than workers. Again, they got to see that little queen flying around. They have broader wings because they have to fly so much and larger flight muscles to propel those wings. And what they do, the drones, their, their job is to leave the nest and they fly to these places called drone congregation areas. And these are discrete places that are about 30 to 200 meters in diameter. And they go to these places and they fly around for about 30 minutes. That's how much fuel they have in their tank. They, they fill up on honey first and they groom themselves and clean their eyes off. And then they head to the DCA and they fly around looking for queens to mate with. And there are a lot more drones than queens. If you think about how many drones your colony can raise versus how many queens are gonna come out that season. I mean, the proportion is really much higher for drones. So the drones are probably not gonna get lucky in mate. So they're gonna fly around looking for a queen. They're not gonna, if they don't mate, they will go back to the hive, suck up more honey and head to a different drone congregation area. So in any drone con given drone congregation area, there can be, there will be hundreds if not thousands of drones from many different hives. And from one hive, the drones that leave that afternoon are gonna to go to many different DCAs. And they typically fly in the afternoon. The books will say one to four. In the Southern US, they really fly a little later. They fly between three and seven with the peak time about four o'clock. So um, they, they will, a single drone will fly to several DCAs in any afternoon. And the thing about the DCAs is they're mysterious because Drones go back to the same DCAs every year, but there's not any intergenerational learning because the drones get kicked out in the fall and none are raised over the winter. So we also know that drones don't do dances to communicate. So it's not like even when they find one, they're not telling their brothers where they're headed. So it really is mysterious and we don't really understand, but there are a few clues. But I also want to mention that there's a DCA in Sheffield, England that's said to have drones in it since 1722, which is crazy. But what we, what the, uh, the books will tell you about DCAs is that they are often where there are depressions in landscape. And I found this to be true as well. So the, the bees fly up and they go out, look out the landscape and they're more likely to go downhill than uphill basically. And sometimes where there's a drop off in landscape is where they will fly up and look and um, be in a DCA. And their visual cues, they fly along pathways we call flyways, and they, they sometimes will have visual cues, like it'll be a tree line or a road or a river. There's sometimes a windbreak, so an open field with lined by trees or a parking lot with tall buildings. And there's a theory that there could be because of magnetic anomalies in the earth. All honeybees have iron particles in their abdomens, and we know that workers use mag magnetic uh, fields as part of their orienting. So it's, it's a definitely a strong possibility, but that's also very difficult to study. In this, I hope you guys can see these videos. This, these are just videos I took with my iPhone with a weather balloon with a pheromone. And uh, I hope you can see all the drones flying around. And you'll notice that they're sort of combined together. Here's the other video. Whenever anything's moving through, whether once there's pheromone in the air, they'll chase anything. So if there's a butterfly comes through or anything, 
they'll sort of line up very quickly in these like comet-like formations um, to chase them. You can see it better in this video here. Whoops, okay. And because drones are gonna be going back and forth more, they prefer DCAs closer to their home. Whereas queens, what they're gonna do is they're gonna go farther from home. So the, there's a mechanism built in to cut down on inbreeding and it has to do with this. So the drones will fly, I used to say a third of a mile and a mile, third of a mile for drones and a mile for queens, but it really depends on colony density. If there are a lot of colonies, the DCAs might be really close to, closer to the apiary. But the um, what happens is the workers and queens tend to go up about eight meters above their hive and then head out on their way. Whereas the drones fly up higher, they go about 26 meters and then head on their way. And when they get to a DCA, they'll fly up to 75 meters above the ground and fly around in these spirals. But what, what this does is sort of a built-in mechanism so that the queens are less likely to mate with her brothers and end up with that spotty brood pattern. So it's sort of built in. So in the flyways, I mean, they will, if they see each other, they'll mate. They, but this pattern of flying on two different levels cuts down on inbreeding, which I think is just a fascinating product of evolution. I'm gonna talk about bee sex real quickly. The copulation takes place really quickly. And what happens is the drone, the, they line up in these comets that hopefully you saw in that video. And when the first drone approaches the queen, he, he'll grab her with her, with his front legs, and she will hopefully open her sting chamber. And if she doesn't, she, she actually has control over that. And if she refuses to open her sting chamber, he doesn't mate. And my little joke is that bees figured out consent a long time before humans did. But let's say she opens her sting chamber and his endophallus everts into the sting chamber. And this action paralyzes him and he flips backward and falls to his death and he dies. And this uh, act, it has an audible popping noise that you can sometimes hear from the ground. So one of the interesting things about uh, bee mating is that the that little end of the endophallus of the last drone stays in the queen's sting chamber. So 75, 70 percent of the time she will fly back to the nest with that what we call the mating sign in it. And it's coated in this orange stuff that's pretty visible to us. But apparently with bees seeing ultraviolet to them, it's even stronger. So that might be something that helps subsequent drones line up and mate with her. And this uh, the honeybee copulation is super complicated and I really recommend this paper if you wanna read more about it. It's an old paper, but it's an anatomical study of the mating process in the honeybee. And I learned a little bit more about the mating sign from this. And this is the diagram and is the, um, the mating sign is actually just the very end of the endophallus right here. And th these are the different views of the actual mating sign. And what they talk about is how it's sort of natural for the mating sign to separate from the endophallus. So you will hear it's ripped from his abdomen and it's torn off or his penis breaks off. And it's actually not, he makes a point of saying that it's, it's not that violent. It's just sort of a natural detachment. So this is just a little bit that stays in the queen and not, not this part. What um, people are really curious about is how the next drone that comes along, how does he remove, how does that mating sign, you know, how does he, doesn't it get in the way? How does it get removed? And nobody really knows, but they do hypothesize in this paper that there are two things happening. One is that the queen's abdomen is sort of pulsating and that kind of helps to start to dislodge it. And the other thing is that these, there's a triangular plate down here with hairs that point backwards. So the next drone that comes up, that triangular plate, kind of the hairs on it kind of pull out the previous endophallus. Now you're looking at this drawing and you're going, well, Julia, like that part's way down here. And this is the part that's gonna be up by the queen where the mating sign is. But what happens when the endophallus everts, it's sort of like, a, like a glove that you're taking off. So the, the endophallus is tucked up in here. And if you would like blow on the glove, it would, it would sort of push out that finger. That's what happens when the endophallus everts. So the first thing that's gonna come out is this part. So that's gonna be the first thing. And then the rest of this stuff comes out. 
I just want to make a little nod to COVID that now when you uh, Google image on pulling gloves off, there's like thousands of pictures to choose from. I don't think it was like that before COVID. Another thing I want to talk about is um, what you sometimes hear is called the slaughter of the drones, you know, that the workers in the fall, they kick out all the drones. And it's this violent thing that sort of happens instantly. And what I read is that um, winter drone expelling actually happens much more gradually. It's not like they all get mad one day and like are off with their heads. They expel about 10 to 15 drones a day, and it can take weeks to get rid of all of them in the fall months. And there's specialized workers whose job it is to chew and maul the drones, but they don't sting them. And workers that attack and expel drones are older and they could be unemployed foragers with more time on their hands during a dearth. They definitely expel more when there's not nectar coming in. And interestingly, older drones will be expelled before younger ones, you know, they can tell. So um, I just thought that was really interesting. I'm gonna talk for a second about this research project I did last summer, we raised drones, um, we took, and this is at Georgia Tech, and we took um, drone, green, green drone comb and put it in all the colonies we could and raised drones. And then once it was capped, we put them into one of these pro nukes and put it in an incubator. They shared the incubator with these Madagascar hissing cockroaches, which was kind of interesting. And then almost every day last summer, I went down to Georgia Tech and got drones that had emerged in the last 24 hours out and glued little RFID chips on their thorax. And uh, this is the scanner. We would scan in the, the, these chips. They each had a unique ID number to know which ones were put in on what day and then uh, monitor them. So this is a little video of me gluing tags on the, on the bees. I'm gonna go forward a little bit because there's a little bit of overlap. So, I would look and pick the most robust, you know, big drones that were moving a lot because you want big, strong drones and check them first for mites. And this, this video was done earlier in the summer. As the summer went on, they were had a lot more mites on them. Sometimes I'd pick off tons. So that was crazy glue, put a little dot, and then take the forceps and put the little tiny microchip on, blow on them a little bit, and then put them in this little tub. Oops, there we go. So this is a bunch of fellows that all have those little micro, not microchips, RFID chips on their um, thoraces ready to go in the study colony. So there were two hives set up on the rooftop of a building with this equipment that had, we put these RFID readers on the entrance. So they forced all the bees to go through this little tiny tunnel. And this was just a lucky shot I got of a drone approaching where you can, the sun, sun, angle of the sun was right, so you can see the little chip on his thorax. Inside this, this tunnel, the, there are two antenna. So the first one is here and the second one's here. And this is really just the depth of about an inch. So there, by having two antennae, what that does is when the bee comes in, if it trips the first, trips number one first, and then number two, you know, he was arriving. If it trips number two first, and then number one, you know, he was departing. And if they just trip one of them, because if you ever watch bees, you know, they just kind of hang out sometimes. That would, uh, that is a, a different type of reading that I'll talk about in just a second. And this is just a backed up shot of that. So these are the two colonies and those little readers are connected to a controller behind this little box. And that's what this looks like here. So that collects all the data for each day, there's a different spreadsheet for each day. And there's a USB drive here that we would download the um, data from. And this is what a spreadsheet looks like with the data. And what I want you to focus on, um, it tells us all kinds of things. This is, this UID is a unique ID number for each B. And then this is the time when the detections were made for the two antenna that I mentioned. And here's antenna one, here's antenna two. So see how this says unknown because it only tripped antenna two. This says departing because it must have tripped two and then one. So back to the slaughter of the drones. I was down there one day in September and I found a couple of dead bees, dead drones on the ground that had RFID chips on them. So I scanned in a chip number and then I went to look to see what readings we had for him at the end of his life. 
And this all happened the same day that I found the dead bee. And so if you'll notice the timestamp, this is um, 1223, and this is all the same guy. This is his name. Well, just his nickname is 5C03. And he was tripping the second antenna a whole lot of times over a period of about six minutes. And you see here, this was tripped 39 times, 33, 25. So this is probably the time that he was, his sister was chewing and mauling him to get him out the door. And then finally, six minutes later, he departed his final departure. So it was kind of cool to think about one inch space that it took six minutes he was fighting to get out. And for the, um, we're still analyzing the data for the rest of the stuff. It was really to get large numbers of flight times compared to ages and stuff like that, but it was, it was a fun project. So I wanna talk about drifting. Drones are notorious for drifting and drifting is when bees will leave their parent colony and move into another colony. And what I think is also hilarious is that when you Google image drifters, WikiHow actually has a page on how to be a drifter. And I thought that picture was hilarious. Um, so drones are much more likely to drift than workers. And this study was done on drifting behavior of drones in commercial apiaries. Drifting can begin when orientation starts. So they go out for their first orientation flight, they can move in with the neighbors. And drift reduces on drones with distance when colonies are at least 50 meters apart. So up to 50 meters on, in this study, it didn't really make a difference on how much drift happened. But at 150 meters, the drone stopped drifting. So that's the, depending on colony density, that's how far your drones could drift maybe into your neighbor's colonies. And in this study, they found with drones that the arrangement of hives doesn't matter. I know with workers, if you place your hives in a horseshoe with the entrances facing out or in a circle, it really does cut back on drift. But for drones in this study, it didn't seem to matter, which I also thought was interesting. And worker drift is tolerated a lot less than drone drift. You know, workers rob each other. So when a worker shows up at the door, the guard bees really check her out. And unless she's loaded down with pollen or nectar, they're not gonna let her in. But drones, most colonies just let them come and go. Unless they're really stressed and they can't handle feeding the extra mouth, they don't mind taking in the neighbor boys. So this is really interesting. This was a study that showed that drones actually contribute to thermoregulation in the nest. So they warm the nest by vibrating their authorities. And there's even evidence that they can, that workers can signal them, hey, start shaking, we're cold. And young drones pretty much hang out on the brood comb where it's warmer and they are contributing to, um, to the warmth in the, in the nest, which is kind of cool. This paper says that due to their larger size, calculations indicate that the larger drones contribute more heat per bee than to the workers. So there, they do something better than workers. Um, this is a really sad fact. Neonicotinoid exposure makes drone sperm counts 39% lower. I was um, really excited to see that your organization is taking some steps to, um, to reduce neonicotinoid use. Uh, saw that in your business meeting, so good for y'all. It's really important um, that, we, that we try to ban neonicotinoids or just so bad for bees. I'm gonna talk for a second about a really interesting paper that I read about Apis dorsata drones. And Apis dorsata is the giant honeybee. This is a little scale of the four different types of honeybees that are found in the world. We all know Apis mellifera, that's our girl. The Western honeybee, Apis serrana is the Eastern honeybee both about the same size, both nest and concealed cavities. And then there's Apis dorsata, the giant honeybee, which lives in Asia, and Apis floria is the, the miniature honeybee. They also live in Asia. And both of these bees nest out in the open. So Apis dorsata, these are workers and they're about three quarters of an inch long. And they live in a, each colony is a single comb that is in the open. So you may think this is like, one colony, but it's not. Each one is a separate colony. So there can be like 50 to 100 different colonies nesting in one tree. And these bees are really interesting compared to our Apis mellifera because they migrate seasonally. So when the rainy season hits, they head on down the road. But some colonies actually return to the same nesting site. 
There was a colony documented that had returned to the same comb after two years. Now these, the workers sort of like Apis mellifera only live a couple months at the most. So the queens live a long time, but who knows what's happening that they can make their way back to the same tree. And what's really interesting about the Apis dorsata drones is that they leave the nest in mass at dusk to go on their mating flights. How crazy is that? So they're gone for about 13 minutes and then they come back and they come back after dark. And these bees actually forage in the dark. Isn't that crazy? And there was a DC, the DCA in this paper was found under the canopy of a tall tree that's a, about 700 meters. This, this one was 700 meters from the nest that they followed. So I just thought that was fascinating that their DCA actually happens under tree canopy. And this is the levels at which they saw the drones flying and that they leave at nest, dusk and that they all leave at once. And then they're all back 13 minutes later. It's a very short work day for the Apis dorsata drones. And their queens mate with uh, an average of 40 drones. You know, Apis mellifera, they say 12 to 20. You'll find some outliers that mate with, you know, upwards of 50 or 60 but they probably mate with more. So they're even more polyandrous than honeybees. And they probably mate with more because they're more likely to be mating with their brothers. So this is a fun fact that workers sometimes act like Jewish grandmothers. This paper, um, the influence of drone physical conditions on the likelihood of receiving vibration signals from worker honeybees. That's just another way of saying that workers act like Jewish grandmothers. And what this study found was that workers, workers are known to do this thing called the shaking signal or a vibration signal that either word works. And what they do is they'll grab an individual with their front legs and then they shake by vibrating their uh, bodies uh, for one to two seconds. And that signals the bee that she's facing that she's grabbed a hold of to, um, to accept some food by trophallaxis. So the, she's gonna regurgitate the contents of her stomach and you know, earlier I said that nurse bees have all this pollen because they're eating the pollen, so it's high in protein. And they, in this study, they found that they were much more likely to target drones who had smaller thoraces than the bigger drones. Because, um, so that sort of indicates that what they're doing is trying to fatten up the smaller drones because size is important um, with drones. And that's my next slide is that size matters. There are two papers here that talk about this. The behavioral ecology paper says that compared to normal size drones, small males achieved half as many matings. And when they did mate, they had significantly smaller share of paternity than the larger males. So, you know, they all put some sperm in the queen and that spermatheca sucks up some of it, but they definitely, even though they, even though the small guys mate, they had a much lower representation. However, they think the small guys compensate for their poor competition by flying outside the most competitive mating period. So they probably leave a little earlier and stay out a little later. And the apidology paper looked at body size and semen production and found that small drones produce significantly fewer sperm than normal sized drones. And this is completely anecdotal, but about the same thing. In the spring of 2020, I did a small study where I was trapping drones and traps in two different drone congregation areas that were about three quarters of a mile from each other and about three quarters of a mile from my apiary. And what I was constantly surprised, so what I was doing is marking one with red paint and one with yellow paint, and then looking to see if I could, if I recaptured, if I've got yellow drones and the red DCA and vice versa, which I did. And it's not really a surprise, but it was just kind of fun. And what I was constantly amazed by was how giant the drones were that ended up made it into the trap. They were just always big guys and every once in a while there'd be a little one in there and it would sort of be remarkable about um, how big they are. This is, my son was stuck home from college because of COVID, it was in March of 2020. So I suckered him into helping me. So the moral of this story of that, those papers is that you need to give your bees a chance to make bigger drones. If you only use worker size foundation, um, aside from occasionally they'll make a little burr comb with drones, they will lay drones in worker size comb and it'll pop out, you know, like bullets, but they are gonna be smaller. They really need a larger cell. So you need to give your bees a chance to make bigger drones by either buying this drone foundation frames that are the right size, or you don't even have to do that. You can just put in a short frame and a tall, um, and a tall hive body 
And what they'll do is immediately give them the chance, they'll draw out these large cells underneath. You can also just pop out the foundation completely. And if you put it between two frames of fully drawn brood comb, they will actually make drone size cells. Now, we know why they make this green, green comb, and that's because it's for practice of trapping varroa mites in drone comb. And I know that people, you know, because of that longer time that these that drones pupate, the, the uh, varroa prefer drone brood, so they jump in there first. And this is, this is like an awful picture that um, I took. Toward the end of the time at Georgia Tech, I found that as the season went on, the drones were more and more, there were more and more mites in there. And I would go home and be like so concerned because um, I was pulling the um, drone brood out of my colonies and I would do a mite check and find that they, the mite count wasn't high. So apparently all the mites were jumping into the drone brood. And what I did was I would um, tag, you know, 10 to 20 drones, but if, if more than that emerged, in most days it did, I would roll those guys in powdered sugar, get the sugar off of them and put them back in the colony. So it was the most elaborate uh, drone brood trapping of mites that ever happened. But if you are concerned about your mite loads, um, what you can do is still let your bees raise drones, but use an uncapping, this uncapping scratcher and kind of just take a little chunk and pull them out and look at them. And if you, if you see lots of mites in there, then you probably should stick it in the freezer. But if you don't, go ahead and then let them raise them. And in the spring, you're going to see less mites in there than later in the summer months. So uh, a fun thing to do with drones that can help you in your bee practice is to mark them with, um, to practice marking queens by, you, by putting paint on drones. You know, it's really stressful to hold that queen and know that if you squeeze your abdomen, the stakes are high. So just t uh, paint lots of drones and that helps you, can, can help you be more comfortable marking your queens. I don't know if y'all, caught this on social media, but on World Bee Day, I think it was last year, the National Geographic released all these, these photos that Angelina Jolie did with a swarm poured on her. And it kind of took off all over the, the social sphere. And there were lots of posts like this. This is one of my buddies in Georgia, Bobby might be easy, hilarious. And I love his caption there, hold my beer. But if he'd use drones, they wouldn't, hey, what, you don't need a beer to pour drones on you. So this is something I did with, um, with some extra drones that I had taken home from Georgia Tech. And so this is my last story kind of related to that about things, fun things you can do with drones because they don't sting you. I'm kind you know, it's amazing the places that beekeeping has, will take you if you stick around long enough. And I got a request from the, uh, there's an, a big Aveda school in Atlanta and the, the head of it, his name is uh, Van Michael. He's quite a character. And he saw that An Angelina Jolie thing. And he was like, oh, so they were doing a big photo shoot for Aveda's. They had a big anniversary this in se last September that ended in a zero. I don't know which one it was. And they're having this big conference. And he wanted to do a photo shoot where he, he wanted to have the bees put on him like Angelina Jolie. And so I explained, you know, that's really the only safe way to do that is to use a swarm. I mean, this was like in August. It was, you know, late in the season when bees are, you know, it was like robbing season and I just wasn't comfortable putting bees on. Like, it's really rare to get a swarm this time of year. However, I'm doing this thing with drones and I get, sometimes I get a couple hundred drones that I can't use and they can't fly at that age. So I did this really fun thing. We did a, a there was a photo shoot with these hair models and I put the drones on them and they took pictures of them. And um, it was super fun. Everybody was so excited about the bees and they were really sweet about it. And the drones did a really good job. And then um, a buddy of mine who I'd been talking to about this, I was like, you know, what do you think? It's pretty risky to, to use bees that aren't a swarm. And he agreed with me. And he called me the night before and he goes, you're not gonna believe this, I caught a swarm. So, and this is just that guy again, they, we, they also put honey on them and watch the bees crawl around. It was pretty funny. So Edward, my buddy brought the swarm and I, this, this part had to be done out in the parking lot. The rest of it was done indoors. And I used some um, queen, I call it queen juice where you put your queens in alcohol if you have to pinch them. 
And so I sprayed them with some of that and also with some lemongrass oil. And this was the model and this is the, the, the head honcho guy. And the miracle is that nobody got stung because those bees were crawling down in that dress. I can tell you that right now because I had to grab a couple and pull it. She's like, get the bee out. But um, it was kind of miraculous that nobody got stung. So that is um, my very long talk. I mean, or, or, this is my very long slide of references. If you, if there's something you want to look up, you can take a screenshot of this. This is page one. And then this is page two. If you want a screenshot and if you need that longer, just unmute yourself and speak up and I can go back. Can you go back just a moment to the last slide and, and a yes. little longer for that? So I want to thank you, Julia, for uh, also your wonderful illustrations that make this so engaging, you know, your own illustrations. But I, I just think it's so rare to have someone who's really geeking out about drones. We usually have people geeking out about queens and the, you know, worker bees and all the, the other yeah. things. And so I, I just learned so much and I have actually a great fondness for drones after hearing I'm from you. That. Thanks. The plush vests and the, the stud like young drones in the hive and the superpowers of smell. I think, as you know, it just really gives me a, a new understanding. One of the things I, I did want to ask about was how, you know, we often jump the gun as beekeepers to cull the drones. And so I appreciate you speaking to that about um, if there's excessive, you see a lot of varroa mite hopping in there um, and you want to rut eradicate it, um, it sounds like you really do want to side with, uh, let the girls have their drones when they need yeah, it. Especially in the spring, I feel like the stakes are kind of lower than anyway, because the bee population is going up the, faster than the mite population is, and that's when they're really needed. So let them handle it. And it is interesting how they'll fill those larger cells with honey later, and that's, you know, probably getting more honey because it's more efficient. Mm. Yeah, and it's fascinating how they, yeah, they provide other services such as warmth. Steve asked um, if you can explain how you trap the drones that you showed in the photo with your son. And mm -hmm. was that a DCS or by the hive? That was in a DCA. And so I built, I have a picture of all my failed traps. I built like eight traps that I wanted to tow with my mechanical drone. Um, but what I found is when you're in a DCA, that mechanical drone, something about the noise or the motor really attracts the, the drones up to the UAV. And so they weren't going in the trap. So it was a real bummer that that part didn't work. So I ended up doing the old fashioned uh, weather balloon with the lure under it and that trap. And the, the two videos that I had side by side, that, that was when I was doing that study. So it's a modified Williams trap and they're, they're just, it's just mesh with rings with a uh, lure in the top. But um, Gerald Loper, who's a, a researcher, who's, who's elderly now, but he's just a delightful person. He, I've been asking him questions and he's been, he helped me, has helped me over the years. And he's really still interested in trying to figure out the mysteries of DCAs. He did a lot of work when he worked at the USDA lab in Arizona in the eighties. And he actually, I was telling him how I was having trouble with the trap. And he said, well, I've got an old trap here that my wife rigged up with Velcro at the top to kind of trap them better. And he mailed it to me. It was so sweet. I felt so honored to have this like piece of history that, um, that he and his lab use. And he said, just don't ever mail it back to me because I've got enough stuff around here. So that was his trap that I was using. And it was attached with, to a five foot weather balloon with lure and a, Tight string. Yep. Great. And someone else, Alex, asked if different races of drones like Carniolans or Italians fly at different levels in the DCA. That's a great question, and I have no idea. <laughs> you can geek out on that next, right? Yeah, it's a good thing to an interesting thing to investigate. I thought about with the RFID thing about taking it a step further and having uh, monitoring these by race and see if they left earlier or later, but um, I don't, it would be a big production because you need to have at least three colonies that made it through of each race. And because of drift and everything, I don't know if that's possible, but it is, it would be interesting to know a little bit more about 
the different races and the drones behavior for sure. Yeah. So before I hand it over to Bob, I just wanted to thank you for all your research and for sharing that with us because this is really so um, important for us to understand, you know, the roles of, of drones, the many roles. And, and you can see in the comments, so much love for drones. Thank you. Loved your illustration. So interesting, excellent presentation. Well, so thanks much for having advice. me. So thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So thank you for being with us so late into your evening. No worries. Really grateful. Thank All you, right. Julia. Okay.